Would you make your way, please, to the book of Genesis, chapter 15? Genesis 15. And when you arrive there, get, when you get done, go ahead and look up here. This is a very important verse. Most of you probably have this verse highlighted in your Bible. It says this it's Romans, chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that how many things, you guys? All things. I looked that up one time in the Greek, and you know what the word here for all in Greek means? It means it means all. We know that all things, everybody say all things. And, and say all knucklehead things. Yeah, even those two. All things work together for good. Now to whom? To those who love God. To those who are called, the called, according to his purpose. I'm going to show you a wonderful exercise today that your Bible is not like any other book of antiquity nor of religion. All the other religions, they have their foundational texts, and I get it. But you might notice that uh, most of the heroes of those faiths are, well, they're sort of superhuman in many respects. If you're in Genesis chapter 15, I want to introduce you to a real dad. He had dad genes. He told dad jokes. He was really something. We're going to see a great story here. Now, you guys know that uh, God invented families. Families are invented by God, and he could have procreated the species by, I don't know, mom and dad doing something, and poof, and there's an adult looking right at him, ready to get a job and everything. <laughs> Have you noticed that families are kind of an interesting sort of species? You're born as a little bitty baby, and the babies can't do a thing for themselves. I know, I checked, I tried. You know, when, when uh, Jaden was born, you know, she was so cute, and I said, get a job, and she was like, what? <laughs> babies can't do anything for themselves. Have you noticed and the whole sort of procedure of moving from dependence, because little babies are 100% dependent, dependence to independence, that's a lifelong process, but more or less 18, 19, 20 years of age, you know, off they go and out we went, many of us out of our homes, see you, dad, you know, I'm going to find my own way in the world. God invented families, why? Because we learned so much about him. Some of us are men, some of you are women, some of us are fathers, some of you are mothers. You've been a small child or no one, you've been a teenager and you've been a grandparent or you know of one. Every aspect of the family is a teaching, an illustration of how and who God is. I don't know that I ever really understood love without works until... I held my babies freshly born. Maybe you had a similar experience. There they are, you know, and here's a little astronaut from inner space. And they're looking at you and they're blinking and they're kind of like, so you're the guy I've been listening to all this time. And I think I've told this story before. When my first one was born, this weird thought came wafting through my brain. Do you love this little one? Oh, yeah. Would you die for it? Weird thought, you know, while you're holding your brand new baby. I would. Somebody burst in the room, wielding a gun, would you take a bullet? Yes, I would. And then the thought, why? This little one has done nothing to deserve or earn this complete and powerful and overwhelming sense of love. Do you follow me on that one? Why do I just love this little one so? And here's the reason. Because she's my daughter. Because he's my son. Harvest, I'll never forget that day. And I hope this somehow captures your attention as well. Why does God love you? And then the various religious responses are, well, you know, did you jump through enough hoops, you know? God's kind of a folded arm individual saying, what do you got for me? You know, jump through this hoop, ascend this ladder. At their core, at their basis, every other religion in the world is you better come up to God's level and then he just may like you. Your Bible says if we, being parents, 
But if we know how to love our kids, how much more your heavenly father? Does that make logical sense? So I'm going to show you today about this, uh, about this father. It's going to be Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. Remember that one? Um, we are to learn and we can learn so much about families. And real quickly and parenthetically, hey, late teens and 20s. This is the time when it's most easily to blame your parents for all of your woes. Happens. We all kind of go through that. We get out of the home and we look back and we look at, you know, how we came up. And then we're quick to point out, boy, did my parents let me down here, my father there, my mama there. That's, uh, that's not unusual. And that's a typical thing. Again, that's a God thing. What, that I complain against my parents that they were, you know, so un this and never that and always this over here? No. It's God's wisdom. Why? Because someday you're going to be a parent. How many of you remember when you were up and your eyes were red and droopy and you haven't slept in about a month and a half? Moms, do you remember that? In the middle of the night, you called your mom and you said, thanks, mom, for all that you put up with me. It happens in your late teens and mid to late 20s. Men am I goofed up about this or that, and we want to put our parents' face on it. That's also allowed by the Lord because God is saying someday you're going to be a parent. And when you're building a career and starting a family and learning how to grow in a marriage, then your parents won't look so sinister. <laughs> I promise. And like you someday, they did the best they could with the tools they have. Can I get an amen for all the grandmas and grandpas? Amen. That's true. That's true. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't hurt other people by what we do. And I want to show you something this Father's Day. I want to show you something about one of the greatest fathers of all time. This is Abraham. Let's check it out. Are you in chapter 15? Look there at verse number one. Now, I'm going to take you a couple different places, so get ready with your uh, scriptural track shoes, but I want you to see it there in front of you. I'm going to start the story here about Father Abraham, chapter 15, Genesis, verse 1. Now, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram. His name isn't Abraham yet. Abram means father. He's going to eventually be renamed by the Lord Abraham. Ham. Uh, why'd you do that, Steve? This always blows me away. Abram, you're going to be a father. But I'm going to make you a better father. And that's when I put the... The breath. The ruach. The pneuma. My spirit. Same thing's going to happen to Sarai. Sarai, his wife, means princess. Or if I can fly my air quotes... Princess. She's a little sort of demanding. God's going to have to put an H A in her name as well. Sarah, the Ruach of God. I promise I won't lose my sense of track after this. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, for I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? You can write in your margin here, Genesis 12, verse 4, where it says that at this time, guess how old Abram is? He's 75 and drawing a pension. Yeah. He's 75 years old. I'm going to give you a blank check, Abram. Whee! You know, we could insert in that blank a number of goodies. On Abram's mind is, I don't have children, okay? But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. In other words, he works for me. Verse three, then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is not my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body 
shall be your heir. And then he, the Lord, brought him, Abraham, outside. And he said, now look, look toward the heaven. Now, can you count the stars? Abraham, uh, no. Can you number them? No. And the Lord said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he, Abraham, believed the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So that's the beginning of the story. We, what a great promise from the Lord. God has promised to Abraham, you're going to be a great father. God's instructions, if you will, wait and trust. What's going to be Abraham's response? Most of you know the story. Um, let's go down to chapter 16. Hopefully that's nearby. Look at chapter 16. Let's see what he does. What he does. Verse 1. 16 verse 1. Now Sarai, princess, Abraham's wife, born to him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant. Oh, by the way, he's 75. You know how old Sarah is? 65. So what? Kids? 65 years of age? Uh, are you sure? Isn't that how it goes? God promises you a promise, and then we look at our circumstances, and we say, how are you going to pull that one off? I know. I got an idea. She had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. You might want to circle or highlight Egyptian. Uh, in the first knucklehead move of our boy, Mr. Abraham, he wants to go to Egypt, and his wife says, Honey, you better not go. We better not go. Remember, Egypt is always kind of a model of the world. Don't go to Egypt. And then what does he say to his wife? Easy there, babe. I got this. Oh, husbands, please listen to your wives. Wives, you don't have to say amen, but you might want to under your breath a little bit. Listen to your wives. Well, they go there, and a number of unfortunate circumstances happen. But they picked up some stuff there in the world. There in Egypt, Hagar, she's an Egyptian. Verse 2, so Sarai said to Abram, see, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Hmm. He gave us a promise, but I think I have a better idea. Please go into my maidservant, and perhaps I shall obtain children by her. Is that what God said to do? Nope. So Abraham he did the voice of Sarah. And some of you guys, see what happens when you listen to your wife, you know? <laughs> Hopefully, both of you who are walking in the Spirit, between the two of you, usually you will come to a godly consensus. What we have here is Adam and, or pardon me, Abraham or Abram and Sarah are not quite on the same page. Now watch what happened in this state, verse 3. Then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, there it is too, don't want you to miss that, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan, so he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Uh-oh, we have a family row here. Now we got some, some proud chest poking out. Well, how you doing, uh, Mrs. Sarai? I'm having babies. You, let's just say God loves me better. Oh, it's getting bad from here. Do you see what begins to happen when we don't listen to the Lord? Verse 4, or verse 5, pardon me. Then Sarai said to Abraham, my wrong be upon you. You made me do this. Oh, we got a problem in our family. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she became, she became despised. I, pardon me, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. Oh, we got a, we got a thing going on here. Abraham's big mistake, if you want to, somewhere in your margin, uh, kind of write, knucklehead Abraham. Here's a big mistake. Because he did not listen to God, he ran out ahead. What always happens? Sin. Have you noticed also, when sin goes bad, I blame others for it. She made me do it. He made me do it. Versus taking responsibility. I hope you know that God does not expect us to be perfect because nobody is. That's why he died on the cross for us. 
And when we make our bonehead moves, don't stay on the mat broken. Get up, repent, and then this verse. How many things work together for those that are trying to do it God's way? But isn't the damage already done? When sin goes bad, we blame others versus taking responsibility, repenting, and being restored. That's not what Abraham does. Now, in the interest of time, look at chapter 17. Let's, um, uh, welcome to As the Stomach Turns. We got, us a, we got us a soap opera going here. Chapter 17, verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, and this means that Sarah is 89, whew, can you believe that? The Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. Well, has any already sort of messed that one up? Verse 2, and I will make my covenant between you, between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Okay, let's see what happens. Again, in the interest of time, verse 15, please. Chapter 17, Genesis, verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, oh, by the way, this is when he changed his name, Abraham. Then God said to Abraham, as, the Sarah, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, princess, but Sarah, Sarah shall be her name and I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Is this sounding a little weird? Because, dude, you're 99 and she's 89. Uh, I have it on good effect, uh, good news, or, or a good report, that Abraham got an A in biology, and he's like, I don't know about this. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings and people shall be from her. Then Abraham fell to his face, and he laughed. Why did he laugh? Dude, I'm 99 years old and she's 89. He laughed in his heart. He didn't laugh. To, by the way, don't laugh at God if you have the opportunity. Don't laugh in his face. But this is what he does kind of to himself, laughed. And he said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 99 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael, by the way, when he goes into Hagar, there is a child born. It's Ishmael. Ishmael, is Ishmael the son promised to Abraham? No. The promise was for Abraham and Sarah. Humans sometimes will get involved, run out ahead, and like God's not, where, you know, Lord, where are you? Where are you? And we'll run out ahead and we'll hatch an Ishmael or two. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Ishmael. Now, Abraham loved Ishmael very much. And Abraham said to God, oh, but remember, I hatched an Ishmael. Remember that, Lord? Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, no, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. And you shall call his name Isaac. You know what Isaac means, by the way? It means laughter. Why? Because God heard him chuckling. I want you to name your boy laughter. And every time you see him move and have prosper and all, you're going to say, that was the time I sort of laughed at God's promises. So well, anyway, Isaac is the real son of promise. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants forever. Right in your margin, not Ishmael, not Ishmael. Now, what happens here is God has compassion on Ishmael and his mom, Hagar. And Sarah's going to put her foot down and say, Ishmael cannot live in this house. Abraham is torn, and rightfully so. He loved Ishmael. But because he misstepped, now he's got a, a challenging family issue. So God says, I want you to, to put Ishmael out, but don't worry, because I'm going to take care of him. Did you know that Ishmael, we know that Isaac had 12 sons, which become the 12 tribes of Israel. Did you know that Ishmael had 12 sons too? 
Uh, if you want to write in your margin here, the 12 tribes of Ishmael are listed in Genesis 25, verses 13 through 15. Ishmael's descendants, those 12 tribes, go on to begin a great nation. Ishmael's 12 sons become the 12 tribes of the Arab people. The Arabian Peninsula, where Saudi Arabia is, that whole region are all tracing their genealogies back to Ishmael. Now, is it a good thing to get an Ishmael rolling in your life? Even to this day, Isaac's sons, 12 boys, I should say Isaac has Jacob, Jacob has 12 sons. Those 12 boys become the 12 tribes of Israel. Have you noticed that since this time in the book of Genesis, that the Arabs and the Israelis are often at odds? Or is it just me? Has there been a real problem that Abraham has hatched? Way to go, Father Abraham. Oh, you're a father, all right. Did you know that since the turn of last century, there in the Middle East, three times the Arab-Israeli conflict has so spilled over that it has almost cost three world wars? Did you know that? In 1956, the Suez Crisis, read it up on Wikipedia, because as you know, on the Arab side, the Russians sort of cozy up to those guys. And then on our side, of course, we're trying to back the Jewish government there in, in Israel. And in 1956, check it out, we almost came to World War III. Then in 1967, the Six Days War, the Arab nations of the region attack Israel. Israel wins in six days, but check it out. Um, we almost came to blows then. The backfire uh, bomber that can carry nuclear payloads from Russia, they were in the air, and so were our B-52s. Then in 1973, the Yom Kippur War, it happened again. I know a friend of mine years ago in 1973, he was in the Marines. Is, do you say ooh to the Marines? Yes, yeah. yes. ooh Marines, and he remembers spending two nights on the tarmac, and there was a C-141 star lifter, and his entire, I don't know if it's a battalion, but a whole large group of guys with all their stuff ready to go, their um, M-16s ready, and they were issued seven magazines each. You don't typically arm a bunch of Marines hanging around with nothing else to do. They were ready on a moment's notice to fly into the region. World War III, Arabs and Israelis. Um, we know the geopolitical sort of um, nature. You kind of want to look at Abraham and said, Abraham, what have you done? This whole Ishmael thing. All right, now we're in chapter 17 still, right? We went down to verse 20, verse 19. Uh, then God said to Sarah, your wife, oh, we did that. Verse 20. Now as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I, am ble I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. And we heard about that. So anyway, trying to manipulate God's promises often ends just like this. Bigger and bigger problems. Notice the Arabs and the Israelis are still going at it today. Three times this conflict almost started, World War III. What a mess. So many regrets. So many woulda, shoulda, couldas. Man, did I blow it here? Did I blow it there? And to this day, we are still feeling the effects of Ishmael versus Isaac. Then I made a note in my margin here. The enemy loves to push these buttons. What buttons? Man, did I blow it. Fathers, you don't have to acknowledge it, but looking back, are there a couple of oy vey moments? There is. And careful with that because the Lord, or I should say the enemy, loves to poke and poke at those things. You see what happened? Do you see what went wrong? You did that. And the enemy loved to crush fathers and mothers. 
with these very, very heavy burdens. So effective is this strategy of mistakes of the past that it often pollutes our present and ruins our futures, or it can. How many parent-child relationships stay in ruins because of it? Now I want you to see how God sees this terrible mistake. Go all the way to Genesis 45. And let me show you maybe a little different perspective. What a maroon Abraham is. What a bonehead. What a knucklehead series of decisions that are still affecting the planet today. Way to go, Father Abraham. Now, before we sort of do that, let's look at chapter 45. Look at verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. Verse 45, Genesis, then Joseph, now who's Joseph? So you have Abraham, and then you have Isaac, and Isaac has Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons, and those 12 sons become the 12 tribes. Son number 11 is Joseph. This is the story here. And Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, make everyone go out for me. Now where is Joseph? Joseph. Well, we have flashed ahead several years. There's been a terrible story that Joseph gets these prophetic dreams. And then he tells them to his ten older brothers, and they hate him for it. And then what they do is they hatch a plan. We hate this kid. Hate him. Hate him. I know. Let's throw him in a well. One of the brothers suggests, let's kill him. Reuben, the oldest, goes, no, 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 no. Let's put him in a well. And he is sold. Can you imagine selling your brother? Don't answer too quickly. Some of you are all, oh, you know, let me think about that for a minute. They sold their brother, and off their brother goes to Egypt. And in Egypt, he works for a guy named Potiphar, and then Mrs. Potiphar likes him. So Joseph is an excellent administrator. That's his gifting. And he really shapes up Mr. Potiphar's house. And Potiphar really thinks he's quite a kid. Well, Mrs. Potiphar thinks he's handsome and says, lay with me. He's all, no. And she says, lay with me. And he's all, no. And finally she grabs his coat. Lay with me. No, he says. And he wriggles out and, and blows Dodge. Well, what is it? To hell hath no fury like a woman scorn. By the way, put a man in there too because we get pretty nasty ourselves. Mr. Potiphar comes home and she says, rape, and this your buddy, your guy, Joseph, I got his coat. I try to fend him off. Potiphar probably knows the character of Joseph, and he knows probably the character of his wife. Parenthetically, the Joseph defense is the most effective. What's that? Live your life as unto the Lord, And then when the enemy comes after you and tries to get somebody to tear you to pieces and they say, that's Steve, he's a terrible, terrible person. Hopefully everyone I've ever come in contact with goes, I don't see it. The Joseph defense, what did Joseph say? He didn't say, nah, he didn't say a thing. Mr. Potiphar was a well-placed person himself. They didn't have jurisprudence in those days. He could have pulled out his sword and lopped his head off right there. Or get one of his servants to do the dirty work. But notice he doesn't kill Joseph. He puts him in jail, but not any jail. The royal jail. Probably because he knew the character of Joseph. I don't buy it. And he knew the character of his wife. Well, there's Joseph again, 0 for 2. You know, I get sold by my brothers. That's terrible. But then I'm going to perk up and I'm going to be excellent for God. They're in Potiphar's house. And then that gets him torn down. And now he's in prison. By the way, that's a good place and a great time for you to say, I give up. But Joseph doesn't. Over 140 ways, Joseph is a model of Jesus. So they're in prison, 0 for 2. He says, I'm going to still serve God, still serve the Lord. I'm going to work as unto God himself. And then he raises there as well. And then finally you have the, the king's baker and the king's cup bearer. They're chunked into the royal jail. I don't know what they did. What does a baker make? He makes 
bread. And what does the, the cupbearer taste? He tastes the wine so that in case it's poison, it won't get to the king. Well, they're both chunked into jail and they have a terrible dream. Joseph interprets the dream and he says, hey, baker, sorry, dude, you're going to be broken. Hey, cupbearer, you're going to go in and be reinstated into the king's house. So you have the bread and the wine. I'll try not to comment on the many ways that Joseph is like Jesus. And then remember me when you're restored. Sure enough, says the cupbearer. And a year later, after the cupbearer is restored, he forgets all about Joseph. And then the king, the pharaoh, has a terrible dream. And he says, I'm not going to tell anybody what it was. It was so horrific. I need an interpretation. But if I tell you what the dream is, you'll make up something. If you're really worth your soothsayer, magician, magi sort of wage I'm paying you, you'll tell me what I dreamed and what it means. Nobody could do it. Then the cupbearer, I know a guy. They fetch for Joseph there in the prison. They take him to the showers and they clean him up. And they get him all squeaky clean and he shows up and he then interprets the king's dream. Seven years of great plenty are coming, followed by seven years of terrible drought. King's all, what should we do? Being a great administrator, Joseph says, let's take those seven years and store up grain upon grain. We'll be the Walmart of grain. And then in the seven years of terrible famine, everybody will come to us and they'll buy at um, exorbitant prices. Here's the king. Ooh, like the way you think, Joe. And so they do just that. And so here we are in chapter 45. Here they are in the grips of a great famine. Who's the only nation on the planet that's got food? Egypt is. And Pharaoh is so taken by Joseph's administrative skill he makes him honcho of everything just under him. Joseph is the man of the hour. And here comes his, twelve, or this time, ten brothers. But he's sitting there in his Egyptian sort of makeup and garb. So they come in and they've had a long journey, you know. And we need to buy some grain. Joseph recognizes his brothers, but they don't recognize him. He plays around with them a little bit. And here we are in chapter 45. You can't stand it anymore. I got to tell him. I got to tell him. Verse 1 again, chapter 45. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all the people who stood by him. Remember, he's a honcho. Got to keep up that decorum. And he cried out, make everyone go out for me. And they all left. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Can you imagine? All these years later, Joseph, gulp. And he wept aloud to Joseph, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brother, I'm Joseph. I want to stop here quickly. Would you join me in prayer? Holy Spirit, there are people within the sound of my voice this morning, Lord, that had a horrific childhood. And the enemy meant it for total destruction and dysfunction. If you had the power, if you had the military, if you had the economic might, to suddenly say to that perpetrator, that awful person who hurt you so badly, what would you say to him or her? I get it. And the Holy Spirit is prompting my heart, I believe. Can you put your face right here for just a moment? What if you had all the resources to get back and to cut deeply as you wanted to? What would you do? Can you please take a note from Joseph he does not pay back in kind remember Joseph is a model of Jesus and when you and when I are tempted to say boy if I had the ability to, to say to speak face to face boy would I give them a piece of my mind I get it 
how much have we sinned against Jesus? He does have all the power to come back at me with a strong vengeance. After all, I deserve it. And with all that power, does Jesus do that to me? No. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move right now. This may be an important moment for some. The enemy has tried to keep you in anger and bitterness and unforgiveness. A father, a mother, or the lack thereof, or somebody in your life that has terribly wounded you. God saw it. Well, then why didn't he do something about it? Please stay tuned for the rest of the story. What God has intended for such, what the enemy has intended for such terrible destruction. Hopefully that someday you would be so weighted down by bitterness and anger and depression that maybe you'll put a gun in your mouth. Don't buy it, Harvest. Don't buy it. They're paraded in front of you right now like Isaac's, like, jo like Joseph's brothers, vulnerable and in the palm of your hand. What are you going to do? The only way to get free is to release them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, do what you do. Bring faces, bring memories to mind. And some of the hardest memories, some memories are so traumatic that I can't consciously recall them. I only know about these traumas because of some of the bizarre ways that I behave. Some of my addictions are because of this great hurt. Oh, in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, bring your healing today. Bring your Holy Spirit power to supernaturally clean, cleanse, and release. I bind the enemy in Jesus' name from his stronghold of anger and bitterness. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Lord God Almighty, what you have done. You've taken all of those horrific traumas and you nailed them to the cross. My horrible things and the horrible things done to me. In Jesus' name, Lord, let this story of Joseph, who is now in the position to get a little skin back, he doesn't because he's a model of Jesus Christ. Who doesn't do that either? I pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. All right. Let's, let's uh, start, uh, finish the story here. Then Joseph said to his brother, I am Joseph. Boy, am I going to grind you guys to powder. Notice where his mind actually is. Does my father still live? He misses his dad. But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed in his presence. I guess so. Verse four. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near me. So they came near me. Come on, come closer. They're all, come on, come closer. They're all, come on, come closer. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Boy, are they sweating bullets by now. Verse 5, but now, now watch this. Do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves. Fathers, are you listening? Mothers, are you listening? You know some of the awful things that you did? Do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves. Why? Because you were sold, because you, brothers, sold me here. Please highlight this. For who sent me? God sent me before you to preserve life. 
God knew there was a judgment of seven years coming, seven years of great famine. And God used you knuckleheads to get me here. I want to read that one more time. Holy Spirit, may you inhabit and empower every single word. Verse 5, one more time. Do not, therefore, be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, because it was God's choice. For God sent me before you. Why? To preserve life. For these two years, the famine have been in the land. Uh, so there's, there's five more to come. And there are still five years which are in which there will be neither plowing or harvesting. And God sent me, please circle that one too. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity. God has a plan for you, my, 12, my 10 brothers. They're going to be the 12, eventually the 12 tribes of Israel. And the Israel that's going to be on the planet, crucial to end times Bible prophecy. The enemy's trying to wipe that out. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now, here it is. It was not you who sent me here, but, please say it with me, God did that. Hold on there, Pastor Steve. I, I, I think I get what you're trying to say. You're saying it's God's will that I got traumatized? No. But did God allow it? Yes. Why? Your specific answer? I don't know. Their answer? Because a whole seven years of famine throughout the entire planet is going to bring everybody to Egypt. And God wants his family to move here. And God is going to save his plan of Israel that will eventuate into Jerusalem and the land of Israel that we know this day. That's a big pill to swallow, I know, for some, but would you chew on this for a while? Just a little bit? God sent me, Joseph, to preserve your life. Not you, rebellious, jealous brothers who sent me here. God did that. How did Joseph get there? And our final verse today, then I will end your misery. Ver, uh, chapter 37, please. Genesis 37. Chapter 37 on this Father's Day. What a great reunion. What a great healing of a fractured family. Brothers behaving badly. All the way to Abraham, who should have watched his P's and Q's and done what God said. But he got to looking at his driver's license. I'm 99 years old. Uh, I can't blame him for looking at Hagar versus Sarah. But nonetheless, an Ishmael was born. You follow me, right? So on this Father's Day, here's the punchline. You ready? Chapter 37, book of Genesis. Look at verse 23. Now this is before, of course, all the stuff that happened there in Egypt. So verse 23. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers, he had told him one too many times about God's dreams. I got your dream for you, brother. Come here. And they stripped Joseph of his coat of many colors, his tunic, a tunic of many colors that was on him, verse 24, then took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty and there was no water in it. I could make a case that he was there for three days. Um... This is another model of Jesus. Was Jesus ever cast into a pit with no water? Which is also synonymous with hell. Yeah. On, when he was crucified three days in the, in the tomb. Verse 25. And they sat down to eat meal. We've got our brother yelling from the pit down the way. Shut up. Then they lifted their eyes and looked. And there was a company of who? I'm sorry. A company of who? Ishmaelites. How do we even have Ishmaelites on the planet? Because of a bonehead move of a father. Ishmaelites coming up from Gilead with their camels bearing spices, balm, myrrh, and their credit card. Verse 26, so Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there that if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? 
Verse 27, come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. To the who? If you would, would you circle that, please? And let not our hand be upon him. We didn't kill him. We're just going to sell him into slavery. For he is our brother in our flesh. By the way, did Jesus' brothers sell him too? They sure did. And his brothers, listen, verse 28, and we'll end here. Then Midianite traders passed, so the brothers pulled Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the who? Would you circle that, please? Hey, dads. Hey, dads. How many of you have some Ishmaelites running around? Would you look at this story? Have fathers made bonehead moves? Look at God using an Ishmael to get Joseph to Egypt. I rest my case, Your Honor, and I give it to the hands of the jury. Let's all stand. Amen, you guys. Hey, dads, would you join me in prayer, please? Lord, I know that enemy is awful. He is just awful, and he never, ever stops. Families, Lord, were your invention. In fact, to get family started, he's going to start with Abraham, pardon me, he's going to start with Adam and pull out of Adam Eve. And here are two sinful people with dissimilar sort of passions and different ways of communicating. How's a marriage going to work with sin in the world and men being so different from women? Trust me, says the Lord. I have a plan for that. Then you take these two young people that are just trying to learn and live and survive in a marriage, and then they got to go to work, and then they have babies. And then those babies grow to children, and the children to teenagers, and off they go, and then the whole system repeats. Lord, isn't that a recipe for disaster? The answer to the Lord is, trust me. And with everybody's head down and everybody's eyes closed for just a minute, how many of us have some Ishmaels running around? Here's God's promise, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things, all of our Ishmaels work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Fathers, I know you've made some whoppers of mistakes. Don't let the enemy crush you with it. On this Father's Day... Can you ask God to search your heart? Can you, unlike Abraham, can you take responsibility? Maybe you did make some bonehead moves. Do you need to pick up a phone today, a text today, and say to a child perhaps haven't lived with you for some time, I think I made some mistakes. I'm sorry. Make a call. Send a text. Say you're sorry. Say that you desperately want to do better. Don't let broken relationships stay broken today. Everybody's head down and eyes closed. Please understand that Ishmael's are no fun. They are the source of a lot of heartache and consternation of wounds and injuries. Please understand that none of us ever did it right all the time. Please understand from the story today, God can use your Ishmael's if you let him. If your word every day, worship every day, prayer every day, trying to get the fellowship as long and as often as you can, God promises I can take any Ishmael that for you is cringeworthy when you look back when you raised your kids. I can turn that around if you'll let me. Holy Spirit, I ask again, would you move through this place of your sons and your daughters? And I pray, Lord God, for everyone who's ever been hurt by a father or anyone who has been a father and has hurt somebody else. I want to lift up this important story. Joseph said it best. 
It wasn't you knucklehead brothers. It was God's will that I be positioned to give life. Lord, I want to pray for all the mistakes and all the Ishmaels that all of us fathers have made. And I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that they don't let the enemy keep slamming them back to the mat because of it. I pray, Lord God, a Holy Spirit healing for dads, for moms, for parents, for kids and grandparents and grandkids. Lord, I pray that any family fractured here this morning in Jesus' name because of your spirit healing, Lord, that some I'm sorry's happen, some taking of responsibility and not saying, she made me do it, he made me do it. Some of us fathers need to ask God to search me, oh God, and try me and know my thoughts. And then after that time of repentance, you've got to pick up that phone, you've got to drop a text, and you've got to reach out to a prodigal, perhaps. And about the time you're doing that, you need to release your father too. Release him into the hands of Jesus Christ, in whose name we ask all of these powerful things. And everybody said, amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. amen. Hey, if you'd like some prayer, please come up to the front. We'd love to pray with you. We'll see you on Tuesday. 